I would like to welcome everybody to the Professional Insight Podcast presented by the Dementia Action Alliance. My guest today is Dr. Daniel Potts, who is an MD. He's a neurologist. He's a fellow at the American Academy of Neurology. He's an author, speaker, care partner, and champion of persons living with cognitive, cognitive, cognitive excuse me, impairment and their care partners. Designated as an architect of change by Maria Shriver, he was awarded the Mer Martha Myers Role Model Award by the University of Alabama Medical Alumni Association for his community service. In 2008, Advocate of the Year by the American Academy of Neurology. His prime advocacy interests are in affirming personhood, building relationships, promoting a culture of compassion and dementia care, especially through the education of future and current healthcare providers. Dr. Potts, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Charlie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I, I guess my, my first question would be, what is the importance of people with dementia speaking out? Well, I think it's critically important um, and, and has not been heard enough, uh, especially speaking from the medical community. And I think part of that is because nobody's had ears, their ears open, you know, to hear it. Uh, but thanks to people like you and Lori and the other folks involved with Dementia Action Alliance, my ears are open now uh, and, and I'm ready to hear it. The importance is, I think, primarily to let us know that you all are the experts when it comes to living with dementia. I mean, that's obvious. Uh, and you have so much to teach us about what it's like, about how we can interact with you, about what you need from us, um, so that we can build empathy. And, and, you know, I think it's critically important, probably the most important thing to train people like me. I can't think of anything more important. Okay. And for people living with dementia, what can we do to make our quality of life better? That's, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, what can you do to make your quality of life better? Well, you, you all have taught me um, a lot of things that you're already doing to do that. Um, I go back to my father, Lester, uh, who lived well with Alzheimer's disease. And I know that some of the things that he did were to find his voice um, through creativity. So at a time when dad couldn't, couldn't talk very well, he was able to find that voice through art. So one of the things that, that I, I would suggest uh, is that can, you continue to look for your voice and be around people who help you find it. Be around people who are affirming and who build up your strengths uh, and, and enable you to sing your song, find your voice. I guess that's the most important. The second thing is you're courageous people. So don't let stigma or societal arrows uh, penetrate that, that armor that you have. Get out there and do what you're doing and make your voices heard uh, so that we can know what you're saying. I think th those are the two most important things, but hey, you can teach me about this, not me teaching you about this. Okay, um, on that, dealing with people de with dementia on a daily basis, which you have and you do now, what have you learned from us? Well, the most important thing that I learned, um, that I have learned from you, is that you're still with us. So that you're still very much uh, uh, present. Uh, and that in many ways, you're more in touch with what's important than we are. Um, and I don't want to draw a distinction between us and you, but, but I, do, I, I do think I have to do that a bit because I think we've got a lot to learn. The most important thing is that you're still present. Uh, the second thing is that you have gifts to give society. Um, you have experiences, you have a life story, you have talents. You have relational skills that are better than most people. I mean, I think that the baggage is put away and you're purely relating to others. 
Um, I think you're courageous. I think we can we have a lot to learn from that. Somebody said the definition of courage is the ability to take on anxiety and fear and move past that to continue to live your life. Well, that's that's what you do. So those are some of the most important things I can think of. How important? What's the importance of a conference like DAA, where you have people living with dementia actually involved? So the DAA conference is very important to me. I've been to one. I went to the inaugural one in Atlanta, and it changed the trajectory of my practice. And the most important way that it did that uh, was that it made me aware that the medical community does a poor job uh, in validating and helping people live well with dementia. And I can remember now a panel discussion of about five people at the original DA conference and me sitting in the room listening to what they had to say and being embarrassed to be there as a physician because of what I heard. No compassion uh, when the diagnosis was given, no resources shared, um, come back in six months or a year, um, don't bother you know, having that pacemaker because you now have dementia, that sort of thing. So I was, I was embarrassed by that. So I think the most important thing is that we can see people living well with dementia who help us take care, be better care providers. In short, I mean, it, it, it really impacted, it really impacted my life to be there and see this, I'll just tell you that. How are you related to the other people in the medical community is, is as much information and stuff about dementia you have, how hard is it to relate that to other doctors? Well, um, doctors are used to learning about the science behind dementia and about medical treatments for dementia and the latest in technology, but they're not used to hearing about how to help a person live well with it. There, there's a focus on treatment of disease and there's not a focus on promoting wellness. So I think to make inroads into the medical community with that message is where I see myself playing a role. You know, I, I, I think we need to get articles and um, social media and podcasts like this and other, other materials in front of them so that they can see that we've not been doing a good job with this. You know, we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's right now. We still need to look for it. We don't have a cure for Lewy body. We don't have a cure for frontotemporal. We don't have a cure for these conditions. But we do have tools in our armamentarium to help somebody live well with the diagnosis. Well, that's part of what we have to be doing. But it's a challenge. Now, a friend of mine and I, Charlie, um, Dr. Neelam Agarwal, who is at the Rush Alzheimer's Center in Chicago, along with Angel Duncan, who's an art therapist, we wrote an article this past year about this very topic. And that article went out to every neurologist in the, in the United States. And it was, it was literally, how do we help people live well? And so I hope people read that. We've gotten a lot of feedback about it, but that's just a start. We need to do so much more. And what would you tell caregivers and people with dementia um, the importance of attending? a conference like DAA and what they can get out of it? Well, it's empowering. Uh, it would be empowering. I can think of when my mother was a care partner for dad. A conference like this would have been so hope giving for her, so empowering. It would have given her tools to manage day to day. So I think the empowerment that's there, I think the education that's there, the hope that's shared, um, and I think the encouragement that life doesn't end for either the care partner or the person living with the disease. It doesn't end. We can move past this. I don't want to minimize the impact that this has on you, me, others, but we can live well and we can do that together and relationships are important. I think those are a few of the things that I would say. Um, why do you think, me, me being a public speaker about this and, and you too, why do you think that there is such a lack of information on living well with dementia? I mean, there's, there's 
articles and things out there about heart disease, about cancer, about this, but it seems like dementia is kind of on the back burner and really it, it's difficult now for us to try to bring it to the forefront because there's so few of us that are willing to talk about it. Well, it's, it's, it's a huge issue. So you've, that's the elephant in the room. And I think a lot of it has to do with psychology. Our psychology tells us that we don't want to hear about something that's um, potentially going to affect us. We don't want to hear about something that um, is a terminal condition. We don't want to touch those parts uh, of, of our possibly our future. So we stay away from it. We shy away from it. And I think that, that people internalize a lot of this. I know doctors do. You know, doctors don't want to talk about things that are um, potentially touch on their own mortality. It's difficult for doctors to have conversations like that. And I think it's difficult for us as society to have those conversations. But it's critical that we do so. Um, Winston Churchill said, if you find yourself in hell, I'm paraphrasing, but if you find yourself in hell, keep going. Um, we, we've got unpleasant things that we've got to talk about, but as a society, we can move past that into hope. But we've got to be willing to cry on the way there. And so I, I think a lot of it deals with psychology, you know, whether it's individual psychology or psychology of our society. Have you noticed that um, when you, you speak with, um, you know, politicians and things like this, there's a, a different sense. I've been talking with them and uh, other people that, you know, the advocates go in and talk with them and they start giving the numbers and this amount and this amount has it and this amount caregivers. And then when I would go in and says, no, I'm living with the disease. It seems like their demeanor changes. And I've even had some of them say, well, my, my mother died of Alzheimer's or my, you know, my father or my uncle. It seems like it, it's accepted more when they start talking to a person. And it's almost like they're surprised that somebody is there with the disease. Why do you think that is, is just so prevalent? Well, I think one of the things you're doing is you're tapping into the D word. You're tapping into the denial that they've had. Um, the, the denial that we all have had. Um, I'll, I'll go back to my dad. When I started seeing dad manifest the symptoms of Alzheimer's, uh, I put, I dug my feet in and I tried to shore up the dad quote that I used to know, close quote. And I didn't want to meet the dad that I was finding on a daily basis. Well, Duh, it's the same day. It's the same day. But I wasn't prepared to see that. And so I think especially politicians that have dealt with this on a personal level have the, have the denial boots on. They, they don't want to see it. But they're amazed at the face that comes to their office of the person who lives with the, the illness and who's out there advocating, you know, who's out there actually trying to make a difference. Um, the human face has a lot of power. And when we see somebody living with it and living well, it changes us. But there's a disconnect, Charlie, I think, between the researchers who are looking for cure and the people who are seeking to help people live well with the disease. And there doesn't need to be. Care and cure need to go together. And so I think a lot of the resources that are, that are, that are being used for cure can overlap with those that are being used to, um, to bolster care. We have to get on the same team so that we can approach this holistically. Uh, one of the things I've noticed too with dealing with, with caregivers, and you, it, it probably um, impacted you too, when somebody's diagnosed with dementia, it seems like sometimes the family wants to just gather around them and protect them and not, not, not let them you know, be embarrassed by going out. But in doing that, sometimes they stifle the person and they keep them locked in a corner. You know, it's out of love and it's out of trying to be protective of it. But sometimes that's the worst thing you can do to somebody with dementia. How do we go about letting people know that 
what they're doing is, even though they're doing it for the right reasons, it's the wrong thing to do. Um, it's a natural human instinct for us to want to protect. And uh, we, we assume in our own egos that mom or dad or husband and wife are going to be embarrassed if people see them like this. We, we make those sorts of assumptions. We try to rescue. When in fact, what we may be doing is stifling their remaining voice. And so I think one of the best ways to counter that is for, for the public to see people that are living with the condition, like you and others, speaking about it. Uh, for instance, when I heard a, a, a former CEO who has Alzheimer's get up and say, you know what bothers me most? People try to complete my sentences for me. They see me struggling on a word and they try to insert uh, the word for me. Well, guess what that does? Then I lose my train of thought because the word they popped in there may not have been what I was trying to say. So to hear somebody say that, I think has a powerful influence. So what I would say is um, we need to hear more people with dementia talking about how it is. What do you want us to do? How do you want us to treat you? And society needs to pick that up. But I think the media, and I'm, I'm not picking on the media, but I think the media is more likely to pick up a story about the tragedy of dementia than it is about the triumph that can be found in dementia. Does that make sense? I think the tragedy is, is the tragedy sells in tweets and Facebooks and everything, but, but the hope-filled stories don't necessarily do that. And, and I'm not saying let's divert money from, from research for cure uh, to bolster you know, caregivers, but I'm saying this is a big pie here and, and we need to get together to do both. I 100% agree. I could, I could talk to you for <laughs> a long time on this, but we're kind of running out of time and I wanted to thank you so much for um, doing the podcast and relaying this important information. And hopefully I will be, uh, I'll be able to meet you at the DAA conference this year if you can attend. Well, I'm planning to be there and I look forward to shaking your hand. Thank you okay, for what thank you, you Thank you so much. And right, you have a great day. Thank, thank you so much. You too, sir. I'd like thank to thank you. everybody. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. And you can listen to more podcasts on our website, which is daanow.org slash podcast. And thank you for joining us.